infinite complacency. People went to and fro of the earth about their little affairs, serene in the assurance of their dominion over this small, binning fragment of solar driftwood, which by chance or design, man has inherited out of the dark mystery of time and space. When it comes to great interview-based podcasts of true encounters with the paranormal, there is absolutely one you should have in rotation. Jim Harold's Campfire. It has been downloaded nearly 60 million times, and Jim himself has been called the podfather and the OG of paranormal podcasting. And it's no wonder, really, because for 90 minutes every week, Jim features firsthand encounters with hauntings, cryptids, UFOs, and just plain old random weirdness. So do me a favor. Listen and follow Jim Harold's Campfire on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to Into the Fray. On this episode of Into the Fray, I welcome back author Patrick Meekin. And incredibly, Patrick, you were first on with me for Into the Fray episode 12. I looked that up this morning and I'm like, holy smokes, that was back in December of 2015. And we're finally doing this part two. And of course, for anybody that doesn't know, Into the Fray episode 12 is titled Nightmare in Holmes County. And Patrick is also one of our authors at Beyond the Fray Publishing. We published second editions of both Nightmare in Holmes County and what we will be covering today, and that is 225th Street. And Patrick, I don't know how you're feeling about this, but either I can just tell people, hey, go listen to episode 12. It's about a a very haunted house and then a subsequent move to another haunted house. Or do you feel like it's important to set folks up a little bit with a background about what went on in Holmes County for you? I can give a little bit of a background uh, just in a nutshell. In Nightmare in Holmes County, I, I do encourage listeners to go back and listen to that broadcast But uh, basically, uh, that situation was my first of two consecutive yet unrelated haunted houses that I lived in. Nightmare in Holmes County shared all the details of a situation I experienced in Holmes County, Ohio, in Amish country. Uh, It began in late 2001, or in the fall of 2001, and continued until 2010. I believe it was February 2010, Um, we first bought the land in the fall of 2001, began building what we thought would be our dream home early in 2002. Uh, The house was completed in early fall, late summer 2002. And uh, once we moved in, things were not what we expected. Uh, There were a lot of things that you, you know, you just kind of thought maybe were bad luck or something like that, or just, you know, there must be some explanation. I don't know what this is, but you know, something happened that I can't explain. And it went all the way into, uh, by 2007, uh, beginning of February, uh, me and my, uh, wife at the time were then divorced. And from beginning of February, 2007 until February, 2010, I lived there by myself. And it was in a home and in the middle of Holmes County, um, you know, basically in the middle of Amish country. There were no uh, I was actually in eastern Holmes County, but there were no houses very close to me. There was Amish farms. That was a uh, pretty bad uh, environment uh, for especially someone experiencing what I was uh, with no one close to me that was uh, able to even not really anyone to even talk to about it a whole lot. 
that and no one that I was close to lived, you know, in my near vicinity. So it was a very, uh, it was a nightmare. That's why I titled the book Nightmare in Holmes County, because I, I, I had said repeatedly during that time that I felt like I was in a nightmare that I could not wake up from. Paranormal activity, just the demonic oppression, uh, which anyone who's lived in a haunted environment uh, is going to understand that. There's an oppression that goes with being in that kind of an environment and basically and then go through a divorce, you know. So it was it was uh, the, the perfect storm of, of uh, horrible experiences. And uh, uh, fortunately, I came through that situation uh, late in 2009. Uh, my deliverance from that situation began. It continued all the way up till the point in early 2010 when you know the house sold <laughs> and i could not believe my nightmare was over um the property and the house sold you know we had performed an exorcism on the house and property in late 2009 all the activity stopped after that and the house sold now i had had the house on the market since 2000 early 2007 trying to sell it after the divorce and it would not sell and the activity only escalated worse and worse the longer I was there. So I, I felt very much, man, I've been delivered. This is unbelievable. Thank God, you know, and uh, I planned on writing Nightmare in Holmes County. I, I found a house in a town in a small town in Tuscross County, Ohio. Uh, so I moved, you know, uh, technically three counties away from Holmes County. And uh, moved into this house in Tuscross County. It seemed to be perfect for me. It was a large all brick house, uh, large, completely fenced in yard, a very large detached garage right beside the house. You could easily fit two tour buses in that. It was huge. There was a uh, an attached garage to the house and another little garage in the backyard at the back corner of the property. So I thought, man, this will be perfect for me. It's not out in the country like what I'm used to, but it's, you know, it's an, I got, I have a little bit of property here. So I moved in uh, thinking my nightmare was over, you know, and I began writing Nightmare in Holmes County, but uh, things began happening shortly after, almost immediately after I moved into 225th Street. And, you know, when you've already been through an experience like that, you, you you kind of second guess yourself and you think, well, maybe I'm just paranoid because of what I just experienced. So maybe maybe this is explainable and there's a rational explanation and there's no issues here. But I kept coming back to, I know nothing followed me from Holmes County, but something's not right in this house. And I actually shared that with my mother. Uh, you know, I said, something's not right here. You know, I said, I know nothing followed me, but you know, there's, there's something wrong in this house. Most people would question, well, how do you know nothing followed you? And my answer to that is, uh, number one, the exorcism we performed on the property in late 2009 was, was very thorough, very complete. If it had not been, that property would have never sold and I would have been stranded there because I, I was on the verge of losing everything I owned. I went from, you know, we were, I, I was married. There was two people paying for the property to now there's one person paying for the property and trying to sell it. I'm trapped, you know? So I, I knew in 2010, if that house did not sell, I would, I would lose everything. So the, uh, the fact that all the activity stopped after we did the exorcism and then the house sold so quickly, Within 60 days of the exorcism, I was moving to, to 25th Street. You know, as, as I'm in this new home then, and I'm starting to write Nightmare in Holmes County, like I said, things just began happening. One of the strangest things happened on what I believe was uh, March 1st, 2010. I lived alone. I had three cats and I had two dogs. The dogs I, I put in the large detached garage because it was still cold out. I came home from work. I went upstairs to my bedroom, which I chose the room to the top of the stairs to the left of the bathroom is what I chose as my bedroom. And it was funny because it seemed like everyone else who lived there before me always chose that room. <laughs> so I come home, I, I go upstairs, I open my bedroom door and my bed is sitting at an angle 
different than how I left it. And I thought, okay, that's crazy. My bed was sitting straight when I left. So, okay, my cats can't move the bed. So I convinced myself that my cousin that I had hired, he was, he's an electrician, and I had hired him to do some work on the, on the house. He, he found some issues that needed addressed, and uh, he was doing that for me. And when, when I first moved in, he had uh, done some electrical wiring in the what would then be the master bedroom. So I, you know, he had been complete for about a week in that room, but I just convinced myself, well, he came back in, he checked his wiring or something, he moved my bed, I'll ask him about it tomorrow. Everything will be fine. I'm sure that's all that that happened was he came in and moved my bed and never straightened it. So I laid down in bed and as soon as I shut my eyes to go to sleep, I had what I fully believe was a vision because it was not anything like how your mind normally pictures things when you picture things in your mind or in your mind's eye. But it was like, as soon as I shut my eyes, laying in bed, it was like I was suddenly standing outside the bedroom door, looking down the stairs. And what I was seeing was crystal clear, razor sharp definition. It was like very, very, you know, very clear image. The colors were very vibrant. You know, everything was very sharp. And I could see a hooded figure coming up the stairs. And what I mean by hooded figure, it looked like a person wearing a black um, hooded cloak. I could see its face and it looked like an old man. He looked like he was dead. And what I mean by that is it looked, he looked like he had the uh, complexion of, of, a, of a body in a casket. And he was like somewhat round shouldered and uh, he was looking down slightly. He was not looking directly at me. But he had a creepy grin. He was had a creepy, sinister looking grin on his face and he was coming up the stairs. And when I saw that in my like, I'm going to say in my mind's eye, I opened my eyes and I tried to shake out of it. And I and I thought, what in the world? You know, I'm not scared. I'm sure my cousin moved my bed. You know, there's nothing in this house. Why is my mind conjuring up these images? You know, so I uh, shut my eyes again. And it was like immediately I was taken back to that same that same spot. I'm standing outside the bedroom door looking down the stairs and there's a hooded figure coming up the stairs. This happened altogether around four times, I believe it was. And finally, I said um, a, a spiritual warfare prayer that I had learned to pray in Holmes County, basically just generically renouncing all the past sins that had occurred in that house and generically binding any demons and telling them to leave. Okay. So when I did that, I shut my eyes again and the vision was gone. Everything was back to normal and I fell asleep. I told four people about that experience. I told my mother, I told um, the, the woman I was dating at that time and her oldest son, we went out for pizza the following Friday night. And I said, look, I'm sure there's nothing wrong with this house and there's, you know, it's not haunted, but listen to what happened. And I shared it with them and I shared it with my best friend. So there were four witnesses to me share, sharing that experience, you know, shortly after moving in. The activity in the house continued. Um, just strange things. One of the most strange things was I would go around at night before I went to bed. I would lock all the doors and make sure everything was locked up and I would start to go up the stairs. I would be on the first floor in the living room and as I started up the staircase, I would have this overwhelming feeling that I was being watched and I would stop and I would look back over my shoulder and look across the living room and every time this thought would come to my mind, I feel like I'm in a funeral home after hours. And then I would actually specifically think of a funeral home I was familiar with where some of my loved ones had, you know, they had had their calling hours after they passed. And I thought, I feel like I'm in that funeral home after hours. That's what this feels like. And it was just very strange. I didn't understand why, but it was just a very uh, unnerving feeling. One night uh, I was getting ready to go out to take care of the dogs and I'm putting on my shoes, standing at the bottom of the stairs in the living room. And I heard there was a heavy screen door on the 
at the front door. There was a regular door and then a heavy screen door. And I heard the screen door slam like, you know, someone just opened it and slammed it shut. And I looked at it and I thought, what in the world? No, nobody's there. You know, my mom stopped to visit me, uh, you know, maybe an hour ago, but she left. Everything was shut. I saw that the door was shut. So why would, how did it slam shut? So uh, that was unnerving as well. And uh, wait, wait, there was a whole nother incident where a pipe fitting in an upstairs wall broke and it was, it flooded. It was raining in the living room and uh, j just one strange thing after another. I believe it was on a Saturday. Uh, my neighbor came over and in the book, I, I changed his name to Steve uh, because, you know, I tried to change people's names because I don't want others to be scrutinized the way I am <laughs> yes. for writing about something like this, you know. You write about per the paranormal, you will be scrutinized. So Steve came over on a Saturday, introduced himself, seemed like a real friendly guy. He, he lived two houses away from me. And on Sunday, my mother, my sister, and my brother-in-law stopped to see me. And uh, we were on the porch talking. And uh, Steve approached again. He, he was with a, a young lady he was dating at that time. And uh, he comes up and he, he told me that, you know, that I was, I'm welcome in this community. If you need anything, you let us know. We all help each other. I said, well, thank you. I appreciate that. And he said, well, that's the good news now for the bad news. Now, like I said, I just met him, but I knew what he was going to say. And I looked right at him and I said, you're going to tell me my house is haunted. And his, his eyes got big and his mouth dropped open. And he said, yeah, man, it is. Some dude killed himself in your basement a long time ago. And I turned around, I looked at my mom and I said, I told you, because I had told her, you know, it's, it's, something's not right here. I, you know, I don't think anything followed me from Holmes County, but something's not right in this house. So I'm telling her, I told you, and my sister's like, what's he talking about? Not this again. You know, what's going on? You know, Steve then, you know, said, hey, I got to get going. I have more to tell you, but I'll have to save it for later. And him and his girlfriend left. I knew it at that moment. I knew that I was to put Nightmare in Holmes County on the back burner. I was to put all my energy into writing a book about that house. And I knew that the book was to be titled The Address of the House, which was 225th Street. It was like that. All those things were downloaded to my mind immediately. I knew those things. And I knew I had to begin begin researching I fully expected at that point, okay, we just dealt with a demonic haunting in Holmes County. We'll deal with this. You know, this isn't going to be an issue, but I am researching this and I know that I'm to write a book about this house and I'm going to put all my energy into this. So that's what I began doing. I began contacting people who had lived there before me. The strange thing was these, these families had never told the other families when they sold the house, they never told each other, hey, by the way, there was a suicide in the basement. You know, the house is haunted. They never told them anything. They all believed it was haunted, but they never told anyone else. And so when I started contacting the families who had lived there prior to me, it was like they kind of wanted to get it off their chest and they kind of wanted to talk about it because you know, when you go through something like that, it, it really makes you question your own sanity. And, you know, it's something you carry with you the rest of your life, unfortunately, you know. So one of the first people that I contacted, I, I was uh, put in contact with the uh, granddaughter of the gentleman who had built the house and then later killed himself in the basement. And as it turned out, as I researched more and more and more, I eventually found out that um, that individual had committed suicide on March 1st, 1958. I also found out that the vision I had of the hooded figure, I could see its face. And it looked like the individual who had uh, killed himself in the house March 1st, 1958. I knew nothing about the suicide when I had the vision. I knew nothing about him. I knew none of those things. So I knew, okay, this is for real. You know, this is legit, you know. So when I contacted the granddaughter of that individual, you know, I would call call the people and I would say something to the effect of, my name is Patrick Meekin. 
you have every right to think I'm crazy for what I'm going to ask you, but I'm buying this house at 225th Street where you used to live, and I have to ask you, did you ever have anything strange happen there? Without it, without fail, they would, you know, just start into all these stories and they all believed it was haunted, you know. But his granddaughter, when I asked her, she said, why? What did you have happen? Her, the tone was, I'm sure she didn't mean it this way, but the tone was a little bit creepy. And I said, well, you know, you know, I'm not saying there's anything to this, but, you know, and I explained a few of my experiences and when I mentioned the vision of the hooded figure, she, when she responded, she said, I, I'm very taken back that you're saying these things to me. And I actually expected that the next thing she was going to say was, you know, something to the effect of that was my grandfather, you know, leave my family alone, you know, don't dig into this, you know, stop prying, something to that effect. But that's not what she said. She said, I'm very taken, taken back that you're saying these things to me. And her voice seemed very shaken at that point. And she said, that hooded figure, I know what you're talking about. And then she went on to explain that she would have a reoccurring dream as a little girl that after her grandfather had committed suicide, she would go stay with her grandmother. And that thing would always be in the house. And she would always have these reoccurring dreams of this hooded figure in the house. She said, and then it got worse. She said, I began seeing it in my own house. And she said, one night, she said, I woke up. It was standing in my bedroom in my house. And she said, it started pulling me out of bed. And she said, I believed it was the devil himself and he was taking me to hell. And she said, I've become a very religious person because of all of this. Well, as time went on and I got to know other people that knew her, she's, she told the truth. She definitely is a very religious person. She attends church and is very serious about her faith in God. And, you know, she, so number one, she, she was telling me the truth. But number two, those experiences impacted her life, and she made a very smart choice to be, you know, become uh, very religious uh, because, you know, that's your defense against the enemy, against the devil, is is God. She, but when she shared that experience, it 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 definitely bothered me. Um, I felt very bad for her. I felt very bad for the other people in her family. But, you know, it got to the point where I started contacting other people who had lived there and they all start telling me their stories. Their stories are very similar, but they've never shared them with each other and they're sharing them with me independent of each other. So I know, OK, they're telling me the truth. Their stories are very similar to what I am now experiencing myself and what the other people who lived there told me they experienced. So it very much validated, you know, the stories that were shared with me. Being the, the kind of person I am, you know, I, I know I'm going to be scrutinized when I say these things are happening. So I always want as much documentation as possible to prove as much as possible my claims. And so I began, you know, obtaining police reports related to that address. And there were, at that time, 27, I believe it was, times the police were called to that address. And the house was just a, a couple, you know, like a block away from the police department. And they were, and, and it's in this little town that is like Mayberry. This town is a very peaceful, nice place to live. But this one house always has the police being called there. And so in a matter of a few years, let's say a, a decade or so, the police are called there 27 times. Well, later, as I researched for the second edition of the book, I got other police reports that were not included with the first police report. So there were even more incidences than that uh, of, of the police being called to the house. And uh, the thing is, sometimes it was issues where people wouldn't get along with each other. Sometimes it was issues where something is missing. So they believe somebody came into the house and stole something. Uh, there was an, in, an issue where three youth actually did go into the house 
and stole the uh, the homeowner's uh, wallet and then went on a shopping spree. But lots of issues that, you know, could be that somebody actually targeted that house and came there and stole. Or it also could be that things were disappearing. And that is why, and I mean by paranormal means, and that is why they had to call the police because, you know, you're obviously going to try to take the rational approach at first and believe that someone actually physically came in the house and stole. But when I moved in, I began having things happen. You know, I began getting on, in, in addition to the paranormal experiences, I started getting these uh, UPS envelopes returned to the house, but I never sent them. It, as it turned out, someone had hacked into a UPS shipping account that I had created years earlier and never used. And they were run, using that account for a scam where they were sending people uh, fake money orders, fake checks. And if those people deposited those, then they would have in some way they would have access to that person's uh, checking account. The checks Okay, the price for the overnight shipping alone uh, that these letters, how the way these letters were sent out was over $4,000. That was just the shipping costs, not including, you know, there's, you know, checks in these envelopes that are not legit checks, you know. So that could have cost me, you know, they're sending me bills for like over $4,000. You owe these shipping expenses. And I said, no, I don't. I never sent this. This was not me. And they were all returned to 225th Street with my name. So uh, I called UPS. They agreed to basically wipe out all the charges, but they refused to investigate to see who did it because I believed it was done internally. But they refused, but they did wipe out all the charges. Um, I began having, you know, all kinds of things like that happen to me. But as I continued researching, you know, I'm, I'm having the same experience as myself that a lot of the other people are having in the house. There was one point where I eventually was able to contact an old woman who lived there last before I lived there. And that poor soul lost everything. She lost everything she owned when she lived there, including family members passing away. Her husband uh, died while he lived there. Uh, after he passed away, her her oldest son, I'm sorry, her youngest son moved into the house and uh, chose. Now, at, at this point, they had built on, her husband had built on a new addition on the back of the house where they had another master bedroom and a master bathroom. So her son moves in. He chooses the bedroom upstairs to the left of the bathroom, which was the same one I had used. And other families before them always chose as the master bedroom. And he began, he moved in early in 2006, and he began telling his mother that he heard people walking in the attic at night. You know, his alarm clock would uh, go off for no reason. His, his fiance moved in with him. She told me that herself, that, you know, he had said the alarm clock went off and it wasn't even set. I don't know why that would happen, you know. Um, his behavior changed after he moved in. And uh, he began saying things that were not even like how he normally spoke. And ironically, he began speaking very similar to the way the man who had committed suicide in the house's granddaughter described his speech. He went out and bought a motorcycle. And on uh, sweetest day of 2006, so this was, you know, roughly a little over six months after moving into the house. He goes to a location that's a limited access road and he's with some friends and they're riding motorcycles. And because it's a limited access road, you could safely ride your motorcycles there. And uh, there wasn't other traffic. And he began trying to do, he got very reckless on his motorcycle. His friends, he kept trying to do wheelies and his friends took him aside and they said, look, your your motorcycle needs modified if you're going to try to do wheelies because um, the way it's designed when you when that front wheel comes off of the road you are going to begin tank slapping meaning the handlebars are completely out of control 
And they said, whichever way your wheel's facing when you come back down, you're going to go off the road that direction and you're going to be killed. Because this was a crotch rocket. Those motorcycles accelerate exceptionally fast. So you're going to be going very fast because obviously you're gunning that engine to get the front wheel up. So they had a very serious talk with him and explained to him not to do that anymore. He rode by himself down to the other end of the road. They heard him gun the engine and take off, and then they heard a loud crash. They all went down to that end of the road, and they found him off the road. The bike was demolished, laying in a, in a creek. It was actually wrapped around a tree that was in, in, in the creek. And uh, they found him. He had been thrown a substantial distance off the motorcycle and landed on rocks. And uh, he died. They tried to revive him. He died basically on the scene. And again, he actually died while he still lived in the house of a freak accident. When I wrote the first edition, I thought, you know, his behavior was so reckless. It's almost like he had an intentional accident. You know, he had been warned. Anybody knows, you know, motorcycles are dangerous. If you drive recklessly, you may you may die. So I wondered, did he possibly come under the influence of something in the house that caused him to act recklessly and caused his death or contributed in some way to his death or maybe made him suicidal? I, that even crossed my mind. Did he do this on purpose? You know, so as time wore on, he had a brother uh, that had also lived in the house periodically with his mother. Now, this was prior to 2006. His older brother had moved in. And their stepfather had attempted to murder the older brother in the living room of the house. He came in with a gun and shot at him, barely missed him, hit the fireplace. Uh, that The son ran out and, and ran to the police department. The stepfather was arrested. Um, he convinced them, the police, that he didn't mean to do it. He was just trying to scare him. But he told neighbors, the only thing I did wrong was missed. I mean, he really wanted to kill him. So... In this house, you have a suicide, you have a history of paranormal activity, you have an attempted murder now, then you have a death of the owner, and then a, a uh, another death while someone lived in the house of, you know, someone else who was living there, the, the stepson of the former owner. So there's there's this pattern that keeps continuing. So, you know, I, I shared a lot of all of this, plus my own experiences in the first edition of 225th Street, which was released, I believe it was uh, September 1st, 2011. Well, fast forward to 2014 and the stepson who, you know, th there was a, an attempt on his life in the house. He now lives in Worcester, Ohio. I, I named his mother uh, Patricia in the book, and she and I became very close friends as I was researching. We talked a lot, and we kind of got each other because we both experienced that house, and we became we became pretty close friends, and we talked on the phone frequently. And I had not heard from her in a while, you know. And it's it's uh, 2014, and I sent her uh, a message, and she never responded. I just started thinking something's wrong. So, you know, some time passes and I did an obituary search because I thought, I wonder if she passed away. When I ran her name uh, through the, an obituary search, it, it came up, it brought up an obituary, but it was not hers. It was her oldest son's obituary. And so I called her and I said, he was at that time 46 years old. And I said, Patricia, I am so sorry to hear about, you know, about your son's death. What in the world happened? He wasn't that old. What happened? And she said, uh, it's a very strange uh, situation. She said, I believe it's linked back to that house. She said, um, you know, he lived in Worcester. She said, um, we lost contact with him. He normally would stop to see me or call me and he, he, he went missing. She said, I did a missing persons report in with the Worcester Police Department. And she said um, they contacted me about a week later and told me that uh, they had found him uh, deceased in Manning, South Carolina. And she said there was no no cause of death 
able to be determined what, what killed him. And she said they found him in a creek submerged in water. She said, I think he got murdered, but they're saying he didn't. But they don't even know what killed him. Well, on the surface, that sounds made up. That sounds crazy, you know. But I have learned over the years, everything that Patricia ever told me that I could verify, it always checked out to be exactly the way she described it. She always told me the truth. You know, but it sounds crazy. Like, okay, so how can they determine that he wasn't murdered if they don't even know what killed him? How in the world did he get there? So I started researching and I contacted the uh, Manning, South Carolina coroner's office. And I said, I would like to FOIA, meaning use the Freedom of Information Act to obtain all the records for uh, this individual. And, you know, his autopsy report, his, his death certificate, you know, the police reports, I want everything. They said, you know, in Ohio, you could do that. But they said in South Carolina, all the records of that happened after he died, meaning his autopsy report, his death certificate, they said that's all part of his medical records still. So we can't give you those. So they said, we will discuss the case with you. I was talking to the coroner's assistant and she said, I'll discuss the case. She said, what relation are you to this individual? And I said, I'm a close friend of his mother and she is, you know, never, she was never got closure. She feels that there was more to this situation. And so I told her I would research it for her. And the, you know, the assistant said, okay, I will discuss the case with you. She said, what do you want to know? And I said, what killed him? She said, we don't know. She said, this is a very strange uh, uh, case, a very weird case. She said, um, we did an autopsy. We have no idea what killed him. And I said, did he have drugs in his system? She said, no, he had a little bit of caffeine and a little bit of alcohol, not enough to do anything. And, you know, as it turns out, he probably didn't even consume alcohol at that point. Um, he had been in a ditch probably five days submerged in water. So he was decomposing. Your body will have alcohol in your bloodstream uh, because you're, it's decomposing and there will be alcohol from the decomposition. And uh, so he probably drank a cup of coffee that day. Who knows what happened to him after that? And the uh, coroner's assistant said even the road that he was found on, nothing about this case makes sense. She said he would not have been on that road unless he lived there. And she said, you know, nothing about it makes sense. And as it turned out, um, he was submerged in a creek in water. Someone was riding a horse down the road. And because they're on a horse, they're on horseback, they're setting up higher they could see his back sticking out of the water. You know, cars that were passing by, drove right on by, they never saw him. But because someone was on horseback, they saw him. Again, not, no cause of death determined. So, you know, you gotta start wondering, okay, how did he get to Manning, South Carolina? You know, in the police reports I reviewed on this case, there was an entry that they were going to contact Greyhound and see if, the, you know, he went by bus, there's no follow-up. There's no nothing that follows up and says how he got there. About probably a week or so before they found him, his cell phone was found in a Hardee's restaurant. So they kept it, but they, you know, they didn't know who it belonged to. They just kept the phone hoping whoever lost it would come back. And he never did. The uh, Worcester uh, Police Department, the, the detective who handled the case, called the phone number and this woman at the Hardy's restaurant answered the phone and he explained that phone belongs to so-and-so you know this individual if he comes back uh tell him to contact his mother she's very worried about him you know well he never came back he was dead but one of the strange things I point out in the second edition of this book because you know when we go to the second edition I'm including everything that happened after 2011 there's quite a bit of of uh, activity that occurred after 2011 but to me one thing that was very strange about this particular case is it's very close in detail to a lot of the missing 411 cases that David Polites writes about in his book series, Missing 411. Okay, this guy goes missing. No one knows, you know, where he's at, 
then he shows up someplace, you know, that's not really explainable how he got there. He submerged in water. He was missing for a substantial amount of time before he was put in or was in the water. But no one seems to know what was going on during that time. There was strange activity with his cell phone as far as that happens in a lot of the missing 411 cases. You know, his cell phone is left at a Hardee's restaurant and he never goes back for it. You know, what happened? How did that happen? There is no cause of death able to be determined even with an autopsy. So these, it, I find it very strange that, you know, a lot of the details are very similar to the David Polites cases. And honestly, to me personally, I always have felt, you know, and David Polites, if you're familiar with him, he never really goes into what he thinks is causing those strange disappearances and deaths. Mm -hmm. But he, he says, I will not say what I think is behind it because if I'm wrong, I've lost all credibility. And I respect that. But in my mind, from my perspective, I always feel like there's a demonic component to those cases. And I really believe that is the case, you know, with this disappearance and then death of someone who had lived in the house. Uh, the other very strange, I'll call it a coincidence for now, is that they determined, according to Patricia, they determined that her son died on Mother's Day 2014. So on Mother's Day 2014, I went to my mother's house to visit her. My mother, my sister, my brother-in-law, we were and, and, and myself, we were all talking. My mother had a uh, condition with her sinuses that developed shortly after I lived at 225th Street. As I detail in the book, Oftentimes, no one would stay in that house with me, really. I mean, uh, the uh, individual I was dating at that time, she stayed a couple times, but she felt pretty freaked out too. And she didn't really like being there. None of my friends that, you know, that I hung out with that lifted weights and were tough guys or whatever, they would not do it. They refused to, you know, they didn't want to be in that house. And a lot of times, like my mother would say, well, I'll, I'll come and I'll just, I'll, I'll stay there tonight. And I'm just going to sit downstairs and watch TV or read my Bible. So uh, she had always shared f from that time in 2010 until, you know, she still says this to this day that she would be downstairs reading her Bible and she would start feeling like something was blowing on her face. I believe it was the left side of her face, but it would always blow on the one side of her face like it was standing in front of her, staring at her, breathing on her. And uh, she would rebuke it and, you know, and it would stop. But she had always shared that story. You know, th that was one of her many experiences that she had in that house. Well, we're sitting there, fast forward 2014. We're sitting at my mother's on Mother's Day, and we start talking about that house. My mother at that point, because she has had all these issues with her sinuses, she's even had, she had even had surgery on her sinuses trying to correct whatever was wrong, and nothing worked. And uh, her voice was very hoarse and very quiet and very raspy. She was talking. It was like basically in a whisper. She said, you know, I'll never forget how I would be sitting up at night reading my Bible and that I felt like that thing would stand in front of me and, and I would feel air blowing on the left side of my face. As she's telling that story, all of a sudden my sister points at her and says, that's where your sinus trouble is coming from. And you need to re renounce that right now in Jesus name. And she says that very forcefully. I, when she said that, I'm sitting there thinking, okay, that's a little bit far fetched, but I mean, I, I get that could happen, but I've never even considered this. You know, I've never even thought about this. And my mother looks at me and she says, will you pray for me? And I said, absolutely. I'll pray for you. So the three of us, me, my sister, and my brother-in-law stood around my mother. We got anointing oil, tried to follow a biblical approach when you pray for healing. And we prayed uh, over her, and I anointed her with anointing oil. And I specifically said, anything that is attached to, to her from 225th Street, I sever your attachment in Jesus' name. I bind you and I command you to leave in Jesus' name. And I was very, uh, very direct about that. You know, I was very serious about it. And uh, we we prayed over her. We finished praying. And I said, okay, I'm, I'm heading home. And my mother lives in the country. And I 
there, there's not good cell phone reception there. So um, I went out, got in my car. Uh, I was driving home. When I got back into town where there was a, a, a better cell phone signal, I called her. So we're talking about maybe 20 minutes after we had prayed for her. I called her. She answered the phone. Her voice was completely normal. It was normal volume. It was not raspy at all. And uh, she says, hello. And I said, mom, your voice is completely normal. And she said, I know the Lord touched me. She said, he healed me. She said, I could feel it happening when you were praying. I could feel it. And I was like, man, that is awesome. That's incredible, you know? So I always thought, you know, what an awesome thing. But in, in, in two ways. Number one, I think that it does say how dangerous those environments are because you have an individual who prayed all the time, reads her Bible all the time. She has a demonic attachment from that house that she doesn't even know she has. You can't see it. She has no idea that it's there. And she's had health issues directly related to that attachment since that time. And, uh, you know, once we prayed for a deliverance over her, it was gone and she was healed. So that is incredible that number one, there is, there is deliverance. Number, number two, uh, you know, you can get an attachment from being in that environment, no matter who you are, if you're not careful, you, it can happen. You have to really pray uh, proactively and offensively sometimes to protect yourself. But the other strange part about that is it's an awfully big coincidence that on the same day that she was delivered of a demonic attachment from 225th Street, that another person who had lived there before me dies an unexplained death that same day, several states away. I mean, to me, that is, how, how do you explain it? How is, how is that a coincidence? I mean, maybe it is, but that's an awfully big and awfully strange coincidence. So these are some of the stories that are shared in the second edition uh, of 225th Street. Um, also, you know, I went back and I researched the the history of the house more because, you know, in, in 2021, there's technology that was not available in 2010 and 2011 that makes research much easier. You know, it, when I originally wrote to 25th Street, I had to go to the library and scour new, newspaper archives on microfilm just to find the article, newspaper article, confirming that an individual committed suicide in that house. That was a lot of work. In 2021, I can you know, subscribe to a newspaper archive website and find a lot more, a lot easier from the comfort of my own home. So I did, I was able to find other strange uh, details that I, that I share in the book. It, it paints a completely different picture of the individual who had built the house and committed suicide in the house. There was a lot going on with him. I mean, he was, in my opinion, a very demonized individual. He was not liked by his granddaughter. She was afraid of him. So he was, mo most little girls love their grandpa, unless there's something sinister about that individual, you know, so I do believe there was. But one strange thing that I found was a newspaper article, it was one paragraph in 1924, stating that, that the individual who I named in the book, Francis Holmes, uh, he's the individual who built the house and then committed suicide there. There was a one paragraph article in 1924 stating that he was going to be building that house at that location. Why that was newsworthy, I don't know. But uh, to me, when you look back now and know the history of the house, and there's, believe me, I, I'm, I'm, this is just the tip of the iceberg. There's many other instances and in, 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 uh, experiences that other people had in the house and related to the house. Most of the people who lived there believed that when they left, stuff followed them. And I think there's very good evidence of that. But you know, when you when you track that all back and you know the history now, it's to me very interesting that there was an announcement made in the newspaper that that house was going to be built before it was ever even built. To me, I feel like you know that that house is a little trophy for the for the devil 
for demon spirits because they've used that one location that they possess to wreck many, many lives, not only just through bad circumstances, but actually through death. So I, I do find it, you know, very interesting that there was an article announcing that house. Now, last summer, I was doing an interview uh, on another program, and I mentioned this very thing that I'm just talked about, about the newspaper article about the house. It was a pre-recorded broadcast, and my audio of my voice was recorded on one track, and the host recorded the, his audio on a separate track. And then he plays them both back. He can edit them easier because it's two separate tracks. And he plays them both back at the same time. And that's your full interview. So he interviews me on like a Tuesday. On Friday night, about 12.50 a.m., I believe it was, he sends me a text message. And he said, I need to talk to you. And I instinctively responded, let me guess, you're editing the audio and you found EVPs. And he's like, yeah, how did you know? And I said, experience, you know, that, that that's what happens a lot of times when I do interviews. There's there's a paranormal activity and strange things that go along with the interviews. So he said, I'm going to send you the the audio track of the full interview, both of our voices, uh, you know, like for like the, the, the segment where this EVP happens. And then I'm going to send you your isolated track. He said, or, or, or uh, the isolated track of, of him. It's his isolated track, not mine. And he said, I'm going to send you the full recording and then just my track. And I want you to tell me what you hear. So I mentioned about the newspaper article about the house being built. I, I pause. He, he responds. But right when he responds, like a split second before he starts to talk on his audio track, you hear a deep guttural voice say, Jesus, like that in a very deep demonic sounding voice. I told him, I said, I hear a demonic sounding voice say Jesus. And he said, that's exactly what I heard too, you know? So as it turns out, we're talking about it at that point. Now it's a little bit after 1 a.m. And somebody starts ringing his doorbell. Now keep in mind, he lives in North Carolina, okay? I'm in Ohio. 225th Street is in Ohio. Somebody is ringing his doorbell. There's no one there. He looks, there is no one ringing the doorbell, but the doorbell is being rung. So, you know, his, he said his wife actually got up and she was mad at him for waking her up by ringing the doorbell. He said, I never touched it. And I think one reason these things happen, I could go on and on with stories of people that interview me and then have paranormal experiences because of the interview. I think one reason why is my perspective on hauntings is I think your chances of dealing with a ghost or seeing a ghost, in my opinion, those are very special circumstances that happen when it's actually a ghost and not a demon. But I believe when you have hauntings, that means that the place is infested. Um, I believe that's always demonic. That's been my experience. It's in a, That's not just the houses I've lived in. That's with houses that I've helped other, others with that were haunted. You know, and uh, I know there's a lot of people in the, in the paranormal field that do feel the way I do. And there's other people who have a different opinion. And that's that's fine. They're entitled to that. But I, I feel like when I am exposing the enemy and I'm explaining because because in my books, I not only tell my stories and tell the other people's stories. I also share how to deal with this because I don't want to just entertain you with an interesting story. I also want to help you understand how to deal with this in case you have to, because as is documented well into 25th Street, these are life and death situations. If you're in that environment of a demonic haunting, you could die because of that. You know, not only can they cause terrible health issues, but uh, they can cause accidents. You know, they can, they, you can be killed uh, through freak accidents, as it's usually stated, a freak accident. You know, no real explanation for how it happened. Or in the case of one individual, uh, there is no determined cause of death. They just know he's dead and they don't know why. So from my perspective, that's, that's what I believe I am to do. That's why I share the stories the way I do in my books. But that also does open myself and the you know the programs interviewing me up to 
it, it opens them up to uh, paranormal activity and possible attack because demons don't like being exposed. Uh, they will mess with you. They don't just take it when you when you start taking back their territory. They don't like that, so they will fight you. But I believe that's that's part of the good fight, fighting the good fight. I believe that you you know you you fight in faith, and you don't give up, and you don't take no for an answer. That you know you keep fighting. In the case of two twenty fifth Street, I ended up I lived there three months altogether, and I ended up moving out. And I, I moved into my current house. I came to the conclusion, you know, we had attempted an exorcism in that house. And I documented all the details of that exorcism because some very strange things happened when we attempted that exorcism. It did not. It, it was not a successful exorcism. It did fail. And I knew at that time, this was early in 2010. I hadn't been in the house very long. I knew there's some detail that I don't know about this situation, that there is a legal right for these demons to be here. And until I deal with that, they're not going anywhere uh, because that's how that's how these kind of demonic infestations happen. Some event happens either on the land or in that house. And because of that event, doors are opened to demonic spirits. They when those doors are open, they will take advantage of it and they will come in. They then have that door gave them a legal right to be there. You have to deal with that legal right to make them leave. So, you know, I knew at that point there's something I don't know, which I, I believe I found out a lot of those reasons. There was more than one, but there was a very good reason that I share in the book why I believe the exorcism failed. But I came to the conclusion that. You know, even if I get this house completely cleansed and it's not haunted any longer, every day when I walk down the stairs and through the kitchen and down the basement stairs, I'm going to be remembering that on March 1st, 1958, Francis Holmes walked this same path with a 22 rifle in his hand and went to the root cellar in the basement and shot himself. And I'm never going to be comfortable with that. I'm not okay with knowing that that happened in the house that I call home. So that is why I backed out of uh, staying there. But like I said, the activity has continued for others. Now, did the host of this show, did he have anything else strange happen after finding the EVP and then this uh, doorbell ringing incident at 1 a.m.? It, I, as far as I know, I have not talked to him in a while. As far as I know, there were, those were the major incidents that occurred. I had another, another interview I did, uh, a program called The Confessional. Yeah, it was in the fall of 2021. 20, uh, and uh, the individual that interviewed me told me that he, as soon as we started the program, he said, well, you can add me to your list of people who have strange activity when they interview you. And I said, okay, what happened? And he explained that the morning that he interviewed me, he woke up early and he was very tired and he was thinking, you know, I still have to, I'm very tired right now. I'm exhausted. I have to get up. I have to work all day. And then tonight I have to interview Patrick and man, maybe I should just cancel the interview and set it up for another time because I am so tired. He said he laid in bed, thought about it for a minute. And then he was like, no, I'm going to do the interview. And he said, as soon as he, you know, made up his mind, he was doing the interview, his bedroom door slammed shut. He said him and his wife got up. They searched every possible explanation. There was no explanation for the door slamming shut. So, you know, I could go on and on with, the, with those kinds of stories. It does happen. You know, I could go clear back to, my goodness, um, 2011, 2012, when I did interviews and uh, late night in the Midlands, you know. Uh, different different things happened when I did interviews all the way back. And it kind of, it doesn't always happen, but it, it's it's pretty common. That's pretty strange about uh, what happened with Tony and his wife with the door slamming. Wasn't that essentially like one of the very first things that occurred with you at 220 that made you think like, uh oh. Yeah, that's interesting. <laughs> that is very interesting. Uh, yeah, that door, the screen door slammed, you know, when I, was getting my shoes on. And yeah, that was, that was one of the, one of the things very early on that I was like, man, that, I don't know how that happened. And so that, that's a very good point. 
Well, especially after what happened in Holmes County with you and your wife and you having to stay there and essentially be tortured in a way. I mean, you really were. There was so much going on at that place. The disclosure of death in regards to what occurred at 220, why did that not happen? Well, the realtor claims he didn't know. The neighbors told me, yes, he did know. The re- the realtor I was buying the house from, you know, when Patricia lost everything, he bought that house at a sheriff's sale and was flipping it. And uh, he claimed he knew nothing about that. However, it's, it is interesting. You know, Patricia is the only one who did not move out and just sell it to somebody else. You know, she had it on the market, um, but it would never sell and she ended up losing everything. Basically, you know, the realtor just claimed he did not know anything about it. It, it, it. it is kind of hard to believe after you speak to the neighbors and they say, well, I told his his realtor that works for him right to her face that the house was haunted and that there was a suicide. You know, I think ignorance is bliss. If you can say you didn't know, then that, you know, relieves you of a lot of responsibility. I will say this. Um, I, I personally, I think he knew, but whatever. He was kind enough. Now, legally, he was bound too, though, because I went back to him and I said, you never disclosed this to me and you had to and you didn't. Therefore, I'm backing out of the purchase of the house and I will buy another house you have listed because I want to be fair to you, but I'm not buying this one. Now, in fairness to him, that he allowed me to back out of that purchase. He sold the house for more money to somebody else and he did tell them that, I said the house was haunted. However, the way he did it, he was like, well, the guy that was here just for three months, he said the house was haunted, but he said the house he lived in before that was haunted. Oh, you gosh. know, so he basically made me look crazy. Right. And as as is documented in the second edition, that family suffered greatly as well. I have had it confirmed to me that they did have experiences in the house as well. You know, I, I went to them and tried to talk to them and just offer, if you need any help, let me know because I, I this house is haunted, you know? Well, we don't believe in that. And I was like, okay, that's fair. You're entitled to that. But if you change your mind, you know, let me know. I, I had it confirmed to me through someone who knows that family that they did have experiences in the house. And there was a terrible accident that happened to one of the family members that is very, very similar to the fatal motorcycle crash that happened to uh, Patricia's son when he lived in the house. So, you know, there's just this massive series of coincidences that just continue, you know, and and my thing is at what point is it no longer a coincidence? Yeah. Yeah. Once you, especially, and I have to say this because there's a reason that you came on so early for ITF and that's because I, you know, I read these books and I had to have you on because these are incredible and terrifying stories. And once you turned in the manuscripts for the second editions, I, you know, I had already, like I said, I already loved, you know, you and your approach to things and the way you wrote. And of course the stories and the encounters, but then the incredible amount of investigative work and time and energy that you put into the second editions I just have to tell everybody, if if you have the two books already, the originals, go get the second editions. And there is so much that we did not touch on for, well, now really, you know, both of these interviews because there's just too much to cover. It would be a three or four hour show for each second edition book. So, you know, go pick those up. Patrick, last question. Because you say that the exorcism on 220 failed, are you worried then? Do you, does it cross your mind often? Are you worried about things starting up again for you? Related to that house? Yes. Um, let me put it this way. When I wrote 225th Street, the first edition, and when I rewrote you know, the second edition and add all that additional information, I was messed with while I worked on the book. So... I'm going to tell you this. I think there have been things that have happened, you know, since that, since that time that, and and during the times that I was working on both books, really, but I have been messed with. I believe wholeheartedly that some of the events are directly related back to that house. I'm, I'm certain of it. There's, there's instances 
in the second edition of, I mean, some really strange things that happened to me in my current house while I worked on the book. As far as future books, you know, I, I, I was working on a book and I, I mean, it's on the, it, it's been, have to, uh, I had to put it on the back burner because I've been so busy with work and everything. But um, when I, when I work on books in general, my perspective I write from is kind of a deliverance minister approach, you know. I get messed with. I get messed with in, in my house when I'm writing, when I'm researching, I get messed with. Even when I did the video trailer for the second edition of 225th Street, I had weird things happen in my house. I would be working on the trailer. I would get up and walk into my bedroom. And again, I live by myself and my, it's me and my cats. I would walk into my bedroom, the door's shut. I open the door and my television is on. I didn't have the television on, you know, strange things like that. Lots of, lots of activity like that. I will say this, it's something I have, I, I have to be conscious of and, and I have to remind myself of every so often that, you know, pray against that every once in a while, specifically pray against stuff related back to that house and in the house in Holmes County, uh, because you never know. I will tell you, you know, there is there is an incident in the second edition when I'm driving home and this was in 2020 in the summer and I'm driving down the freeway and I'm going right past that. I'm right to where you get off the freeway to go to that town where 225th Street is located. And I see this crazy looking thing in the middle of the road on a freeway. And I, I personally, the more I've researched and the more I know, I think that it's, that was, it was, it was demonic. It was not a person. You know, I, I called 911 and reported immediately. I thought someone was trying to commit suicide in the middle of the freeway. You know, the, the state patrol responded. The local police from that town responded. Nothing. They found no one. They found nothing. <laughs> there may end up having to be a third edition too, because um, there's things that happened in that location after that. I, bad things happened there, you know. So I have to be aware, and, and like I said, pray against every so often. Just take like a an, an inventory, and you know, some of the things I'm dealing with could this be related back to 225th Street? Could this be related to Nightmare in Holmes County? And then specifically pray against those things. So yes, it is a possibility. I and I do have to be. Uh, at least aware that at any time I could be dealing with something that re, uh, relates back to those locations. What did that thing in the middle of the road look like? <laughs> it looked like in, in the form of a person, it was like a silhouette. And it's the weirdest thing. Cause I mean, I'm coming, there's a slight bend in the freeway right there. My lights can't illuminate ex exactly what it looks like. You know, but it looked like like details of the face or the clothes. But what I could tell was it looked like a person. It was standing in a very strange posture with its arms like from the elbows up were uh, upward. Like it's hard to even describe like it didn't have its hands at its side. It had its arms bent with its el like from at the elbow with its hands up near its shoulders. It had a slight bend in its knees. It was a very strange posture. It had crazy looking, everything looked black. It had crazy looking hair. I could tell like from the outline, it looked like it was wearing clothes that looked very ratty looking, very just like kind of torn up looking. It was very strange. And it happened so quick. I had to approach it as this is a person and they're going to commit suicide. You know, they're right in the middle of the freeway. I'm probably done 70, let's be honest, maybe 80. <laughs> <laughs> down the freeway and boom, there's this thing right in the middle of the freeway. So um, I treated it as though it really is a person, but no one was ever found there. And then very bad things happened after that in that same location. Very, uh, very bad things happened right there after that. So I do believe what I saw was demonic. I do believe that. Call me crazy. But of course, I do have the 911 call. I, I obtained the records of that. I have the police logs that show that they responded. I have the state patrol report showing that they responded and they found no one. It's definitely something that 
Yeah, I, I have. I'll, I'll live with it the rest of my life. I'm sure of that I will. And any of the other places I visited, you know, when I share these stories, you're going to get messed with. And uh, quite frankly, there's. It's not only just the whole issue of those locations and what can still be lurking around, following you around, looking for an opening to attack you. It can also be there's people that really do not like my perspective, and so they they maybe they dabble in in the occult and they will conjure things. I have experiences like that, more than one. And sometimes it was, I fully believe I was being set up for something very bad to happen to me. And uh, and it was by people that were, that were setting me up. In the other instance, there was paranormal activity that I cannot explain that I believe was a warning from a Satanist. Um, you mean that after you've gone on a show, you think that you've picked up maybe some darkness from somebody essentially cursing you in a way? Of, of, of course, wow. definitely. I'll go one farther. There's people that I know, and I have to be very careful how I say this. There's people that I know in everyday life that one individual, right after I met him, I knew that guy's into bad stuff. I know he is. Of course, it was all true. I ended up finding out that it was true. I found like a mountain of evidence that the guy's heavily into the occult and he had a major problem with me. And there were some other people involved more secretly in the same kind of stuff. I, I was actively being cursed. And, and uh, I'll, I'll give you an example. I, I uh, dealt with a situation with some people doing some really bad things. I, I took the high road, did the right thing. Things did not turn out well for them. I walked into my music studio one day. That studio, it's all the walls are like double walled, two layers thick. I mean, it's very soundproof, very dense structure because if I have guitar amps cranked, I don't want to hear them outside. I don't want the neighbors to hear it. I don't want to hear their lawnmowers while I'm recording, you know? So I go in there. I have to go through three locked doors to get in there. I'm the only one with the keys. I walk in and I'm like, what is that? There's a dead sparrow laying on the floor in the middle of the room. How did it get there? In a it's windowless room. In a windowless room. <sighs> and it's already dead. It was placed there somehow. I didn't do it. And and as I looked that up, that is usually, and, and I heard Ted Gunderson talk about some of this stuff years ago, and I never understood it, but I knew it was a fact. I just didn't know what the meaning of it was. But a lot of times when they're satanic ritual murders, they will leave bird feathers or a bird specifically like a sparrow. A lot of times they'll leave that at the scene as, as a uh, basically a marking that this is who did this, you know, this, this was satanic in nature, but the leaving a sparrow like that is generally a warning. I'm going to say it more than a warning. It's a threat. Um, cause there's a big difference between a threat and a warning. And, uh, it, I believe it was a threat from the Satanists that I had dealt with. But again, there is no explanation for how that got in that room. Yeah. That, that gave me chills when you said that. Um, yeah. And, and I'll tell you, I, have, I, I had a list of people. <laughs> I have two prayer lists. <laughs> one is good. One is bad. <laughs> one is people that I want God to protect and I want God to prosper them and bless them and take care of them and, and all that good stuff, you know. And the other one are people that are, you know, I don't want evil on them, but I am praying that they are, they are bound. The demons controlling them are bound and that, you know, spiritual warfare prayers against them and the things they're doing. Now, the ultimate goal, I would like for them to turn their life around and follow God. That would be great. But I also know we all have free will and they've chosen a path and they're cho they're choosing evil. And uh, they're, they're, I have two different prayer lists, you know, and I've seen people do a lot of things. The Bible is very clear. God sees the wicked and what they're doing and he laughs at them because he knows their day is coming. That's in the Bible. God is a loving God, but w w if you're out doing bad things and hurting people and, and, and doing things that, that are, you know, very, especially if you get into all the demonic stuff, you know, he, he's not cool with that. And he is, you will be judged for it. But, you know, I do have, like I said, I have two prayer lists. <laughs> Ultimately, I want the, the evil to be bound and stopped. You know, obviously I want the good to, pro to, to, to you know, the good people I want to be, be protected and prosper and, and all those things, you know. 
I got to say, it's a wonder then that you ever speak about this or write about any of this after going through what you have, right? I mean, we're all lucky to be even talking to you right now because I I think most people would just, I mean, they would just completely shut down if even after what happened in Holmes County to begin with. Yeah. 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 And, and, um, you know what? Maybe I'm <laughs> too stupid to shout up. I don't know. I don't, I feel like it's a personality thing. Like if I feel like I'm supposed to do it, I can't not do it. I have to do it. So I think that's a big part of it. The other thing is if it, like if 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 somebody's going to challenge me like that, I'm going to accept the challenge, you know. And and the other thing is um to me it's all spiritual. You know, it, it, everything comes down to you got your good side and your bad side. And if you're on the bad side and you're challenging me, I'm going to address it and I'm going to deal with it. But um, it would be much easier to go through life out without ever talking about this. I would probably experience a lot less negativity, a lot less paranormal activity. I think that we are supposed to, you know, when you share it, you're helping others. Absolutely. That, that's what I think it really comes down to. Yeah. And that that's what I was, I was going to say the same thing. I think that's uh, maybe a big reason why you're here. And I'm sure that your faith puts a, a bigger target on your back, you know, and compound that to living in these very haunted and maybe even demonic infested places. And uh, yeah. yeah, maybe that's why you're here. You're, you're not here to, to uh, zip it up essentially and tell people, well, you can, you can, you know, figure this out on your own, you're, you're sharing to to try to actually help people. But that's unfortunate that then you have folks that somehow get a dead sparrow through three locked doors where you only have the, that story blows my mind. It really does. And it's, it's not the absolute weirdest out of anything. It's just one of the weirdest in, in both of these situations. And then subsequently your, your daily life. I mean, you actually have to deal with this stuff. This is uh it's all great to, to go watch the raft, uh, you know, on uh, Stephen King's, the raft, and that's all scary, creepy, but you actually deal with this stuff. Well, you know what, here's the other thing I've come to the conclusion of, and this is going to sound very uh, conspiracy theory, but I'm, I, I believe it's the truth. In in the one instance with the one individual, I knew, I mean, almost immediately upon meeting him that he was in the satanic realm. I knew it and I recognized weird jewelry he was wearing and I was like, okay, that's not good. Well, then I found out later, I mean, a mountain of evidence that he was over his head in that stuff, you know, but here's reality. Most of the people in there, you don't know are because they are somebody who is in a very prominent position in a community and possibly the legal system, <laughs> whatever, in, in this organization or that organization, and they don't broadcast that stuff. It's very secretive. And, and you look at secret societies. Why do people get involved in secret societies? In general, it's the same reason people outwardly just openly sell their soul to the devil. It's for success. When you join a secret society, okay, you're part of the group now. We all protect each other. We all, you know, your businesses are going to prosper now, whatever. That's ultimately the thing behind it. I mean, I know there's people that get involved in certain secret societies because they think, oh, this is a good organization and I want to be involved. But they also know this is a very tight knit group and they help each other and protect each other. In reality, in real life, a lot of those heavy hitter satanic individuals, people do not know that they're involved in those things. And uh, that's that's unnerving, but it is the truth. There's an old movie called Spellbinder. I don't know if you've ever seen it. I think the guy's name's Timothy Daly. He he was on Wings. He's a very good actor. Um, he's in the movie, and it's about he rescues this girl from a satanic cult. He's an attorney. And throughout that movie, like it's so realistic about the way these these satanic cults deal with things. And I won't tell you the end of the movie, but it is it is unbelievable the way the movie ends. But it, he does a the, the the producer of that movie did a great job of showing that, yeah, the people involved in this a lot of times, yeah, you got your people that all that uh you know you look at them and you, you think oh yeah they're into weird stuff, but most of them you have no idea. I mean, goodness gracious, Patrick, talk about having to watch your back. Yeah, most definitely. Most definitely. And I'll tell you this, it's police officers, it's attorneys, it's, it's people that you don't 
you wouldn't even believe because you you assume when somebody takes a vow to protect and serve that that's what they mean. A lot of them do. And that's exactly what they feel it's a calling in life and they're very good at it. And God bless them. That's awesome. But there, there's others that get into it for all the wrong reasons and they are involved in very dark things. Well, the really terrifying thing is look what they're capable of. The Sparrow, let's just go ahead and go back to that uh, absolutely terrifying yep. little incident. And then you yep. have people capable of that that actually hate and loathe you. That's horrifying. Yeah. Well, let, let me let me give you an example. About a year before the Sparrow incident, there was another run in with the same individuals. And I cannot go into detail. I'd be I'd love to, but I really can't. It, I, I don't want to, uh, you know, make myself liable in any way. But I had another run in with the same individuals. Of course, I did the right thing. I, I, I took the high road, dealt with it appropriately. I got a phone call one night out of the blue. I'm driving home from work. It's after midnight. I see the number. I think, oh, this must be one of the guys I work with. And he has a question. And one of the guys that works midnights, he's calling me to ask me a question. So I'll take the call. I answer the phone. It's not him. It's somebody that I've never met. And this guy's telling me, hey, uh, I need help. My house is haunted, blah, blah, blah. My girlfriend, I think, is possessed. You know, there's all this weird stuff going on. And I need help really bad. And I said, um, how'd you get my phone number? He changes the subject, keeps talking, you know. So I shared some spiritual warfare prayers with him. And I said, this is what you need to do. And he sends me this video that allegedly shows paranormal activity in his house. The issue was to me, it looked, it's like too convenient. Like why, why was there uh, like a cell phone or something up on a shelf recording the room and recording his girlfriend without her knowledge or what it looks staged. This looks staged. Yes. Uh, there appears to be weird things like doors opening for no reason, but it looks staged. Well, he sent me this video. I said, man, I really need your help. How much do you charge to help someone? I said, I don't charge to help people. And he said, well, I need help. And he sends me the video. So I told him, I said, well, I'll pray for you. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what you need to do. I had a very uneasy feeling. And I, I was like, this guy knows my work schedule. This guy knows my phone number. And I don't know how he got him. So I, I took the video to work. And I showed it to two of my coworkers that I trust. And I showed them independent of each other. And I said, what do you think of this? And without the other one even being present, they both said the same thing. They said, Pat, that is, you know, that's creepy looking. That looks like a legit video, but it's staged because there's, it, it looks too perfect. And I said, yeah, I was thinking that too. And both of those individuals said, do not have anything to do with this. Stay away from this situation. You're being set up. And I said, yeah, that's what I thought too. Well, the guy keeps calling me. And again, always he knows right when I'm getting off work and he calls me or he texts me or then the girlfriend starts texting me. It got very strange, you know, and I kept thinking like, I'm, I'm definitely being set up. Well, he starts offering me, look, I have money. I will give you $5,000 if you will come to the house for one hour. Wow. And my gut instinct on the whole situation was they want me in that house and I'm either getting bumped off or the girlfriend's going to make an accusation that I did or said something I didn't and try to ruin me because somebody else just really did do something bad. I reported things appropriately and they got had a lot of issues because of it. So I feel like this is a setup and I think these people are behind it, you know, that I the, the, the bad people I had I had dealt with. So I, I just really felt like, you know, I'm being set up. I said, look, I already told you, I don't charge to help people. I don't want your money. I said, um, but I, I told you what you need to do. I said, I will refer you to a different deliverance minister if that's, if you feel you need more than that. And he was adamant that it had to be me. And he wanted me to come to that house in, in Canton, Ohio. And where I worked at that time was in Canton, Ohio. He would start messaging me about the time I would be getting done for work, like begging me to come to this house and offering, you know, $5,000 if you come to the house for one hour. Mm. Okay, whatever. So um, I basically said, don't contact me again. And I said, tell, and I named the people that I thought were behind it. I said, tell them I said, nice try. 
But I said, if you contact me again, I'm going to the police and you're going to be charged with stalking because I've told you to leave me alone and you're still doing it. Well, along the way, right, you know, like the second or third time I talked to him, I, I, I continued asking, how did you get my phone number? And he said, oh, he told me someone that I worked with gave him my phone number. And it was an older lady that's a very nice lady. And he said, she gave me your phone number. I'm related to her. So as it turned out, um, I eventually, you know, after I told him, do not contact me again, I spoke to that individual that I worked with. And she said, Pat, I would never give out your phone number to anybody without your permission. And she said, um, I didn't do it. She said, and I, I am distantly related to them and they are strange people. Stay away from them. They're bad. I heard from other people, they were mafia involved in a mob and everything else, mm. you know. So they eventually, they did leave me alone, but I'm sorry. The timing is so suspicious that right after, you know, I deal with this other situation, these people out of the blue suddenly have my phone number, suddenly know my work schedule and are begging me to come to this house to, you know, they thought they would lure me in by, cause they know I like to help people. So they thought that's how they would lure me in. And there's no doubt in my mind that was a hit, a hit, an attempted hit on me in some regards. Either I was going to get shot or there was going to be some crazy accusation made against me to try to get me arrested or something like that. There's no doubt in my mind. But those are the kind of things I get to deal with on top of the paranormal activity. <laughs> Yeah, I was going to say, uh, huzzah, book three, but I don't know. Maybe you shouldn't be poking the dark and dangerous bear any more than you need to, you know? I mean, gosh. Yeah, it, it's definitely uh, it's definitely interesting, but I do think that – I think it just goes with the territory. It, it, it's kind of like this, you know, in on the good side of things, God generally – yes, see, there are miracles that happen. Yes, there's angelic assistance. Yes, sometimes there's angelic intervention. But God generally uses people to do his work on earth. He equips them. But by the same token, the devil, yes, he uses demons. Yes, he uses demonic power. But he also generally uses people to do his deeds on the earth as well. So that's kind of how it really does work. If, if you're going to be on the side of light and be on the side of God, you know, you are your attacks are going to come and they're going to come spiritually and physically. That's, that's just the way it is. Well, again, uh, everybody, uh, as you can tell, these are two very thorough and well-researched books by Patrick Meekin and Patrick, please let everybody know where to find you. And of course the books. Okay. You can find me uh, on Facebook. Um, I have, you know, just my regular page and then I have, you know, uh, pages for 225th street and nightmare in Holmes County. And uh, my books are available at Amazon uh, through uh, Beyond the Fray Publishing. Uh, both, again, both books are second editions, greatly expanded upon uh, compared to the first editions with lots of new information. But both are available as uh, Kindle versions and paperbacks on Amazon. Well, Patrick, such a pleasure to have you back on finally. I appreciate your time today. I appreciate you having me on. Thank you.